the king of the asteroid belt and home to belters. Let's talk about the science of the Expanse, Ceres Station. Ceres is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt at about a thousand kilometers across. It's classified as a dwarf planet. Compared to other objects in the asteroid belt, it's very, very large. Eros and Vesta are the next two largest asteroids. You see Vesta is pretty close in size, but Eros, which we've also seen in the Expanse, that's about 21 kilometers across, so it is absolutely dwarfed by the size of Ceres. Conversely, compared to the Earth and the Moon, Ceres is quite small though, so it's worth keeping in mind that while it's the king of the asteroid belt, it's just a dwarf planet. Its size is one of the factors that keeps it classified as that, so it's important to realize just how big it is in comparison. In the setting of the Expanse, Ceres is used as the major hub of civilization for the Belter Society. It is a place that was hollowed out and mined at one time, and right now it contains about 6 million Belters that live out there on it. It serves as a vital link between Mars and the outer planets as well as Earth, but it's a bit of a mistake to think of the solar system as having fixed geography. It's important to keep in mind that all of these bodies are in motion in relative to one another so that at any given moment it's quite possible that Ceres could be on the other side of the solar system compared to Earth, Mars, and Jupiter depending on the relative position of their orbits at the time. One of the quotes I find really interesting about Ceres in the setting of the Expanse is that it was said to have enough water for about a thousand generations or more, and that it was all taken away by Earth and Mars. Now that fact was actually written before we sent out some probes to Ceres. We've had a few years where we had some more data about it, and it was found that Ceres had much more water than we originally thought, that it maybe up to 30% of the mass of Ceres is water, and fresh water at that. So that little fact just thrills me to no doubt, and it really expresses what a living and vibrant science astronomy is, that we're finding things out all of the time, so that even in narratives using our current understanding of the solar system, we're updating it all the time, so we're adding new facts, and it's much more complex than we originally thought. Now, in the world of the Expanse, in order for it to be set up as a habitable station for members of the Belt to live out there, what they said happened was the Tycho station was engineered and put out there to spin Ceres up faster, so that they can build tunnels inside of it, and that the spin of Ceres, the fast spin of Ceres, would give it enough gravity to let people live on it. And it was spun up fast enough to provide one third of a G, which is about the gravity you get on Mars. So do some of the math here, normally Ceres rotates once er, about every nine hours, a little bit over, but er, about every nine hours. For it to achieve one-third gravity outward, it would have to be spun up about 14 times the speed it has now, so it would need to rotate once about every 40 minutes. Now the first thing to note is this is a fictional setting, and were Ceres to be spun up that fast, it would just fly apart. So that's the fact that people like to ask right away about Ceres, is that possible? So let's get to the possibility of whether you could spin something up like that in a moment. But let's just say it were to be, all bodies in the solar system have what they call a Roche limit. And that really just expresses at what point two bodies can get close enough to one another that the tidal forces between them from gravity pull apart the smaller object. Similar theories apply here, but really the fact to remember is that Ceres would just fly apart. It would not be able to hold together at one third gravity spinning outwardly. But that's irrelevant. It's a narrative setting. It's an important narrative element to have a major settlement in out in the belt so that we can sort of use that as a backdrop for the political setting of the expanse. So no harm, no foul, not a problem. But let's talk about how they might spin something like that up. Now that is out of, out of the bounds of normal science. We don't have a way to spin up a body, especially the size of Ceres right now. So let's not spend too much time on the theory of trapping some engines or a long string to it. That's impractical and it really wouldn't happen. Uh, there's a YouTuber named Scott Manley who I highly recommend. He's got a great video on how many engines it would take and how many Epstein's drive it would take to do that. But the, the short answer is it's just not practical and it really wouldn't happen. I'll link to that show in the show notes, by the way. Understanding that this would take some sort of science that we do not currently have or uh, some sort of engineering that we're not able to currently realize in order to do this, most people feel that it must take something akin to what they call the Yorp effect for asteroids. The Yorp effect is something that happens in the real world. Asteroids actually do spin up faster and in many many cases we've seen, well in several cases anyway, we've seen asteroids out in the solar system have been broken up because of the speed of their spin. What happens is that incoming sunlight 
uh, from the sun heats up one side of a body that's it's rotating especially if it's uneven and as it rotates it and it radiates infrared radiation at one of the other sides it provides a little bit of torque to that object and over a long period of time it might spin it up but these time periods we talk about are like a million years to double the speed of smaller bodies and so forth so this isn't really practical as a way to spin up series however looking forward to sort of discoveries that we haven't made yet most people feel like that there probably is something similar to the Yorp effect at play here in terms of how they must have spun series up in my mind it's likely that they coated coated series with some sort of super material that absorbed sunlight and emitted some sort of force producing uh, radiation of some kind that provided some kind of super torque and maybe they surrounded series with a bunch of mirrors to concentrate sunlight it's really unknown but they must have done it somehow we know that in the expanse that the universe the setting has established that primarily through the proto molecule that it is possible to change the inertia of objects so were they to have proto molecule technology certainly that could be done very easily uh, there's no indication that they have that maybe there is some kind of very large area acting inertial dampening field that lets them provide some sort of spin to series but we just we have no indication of that in the series so we really can't comment so I'm guessing some sort of combination of a super material they co coated it with with concentrated sunlight from the Sun along with some other factor maybe some sort of field that provided some sort of energy to it that must have provided the spin to series that's of course assuming it would hold together that's my theory Theory. I would love to hear what you think on how a series must have held together and how it must have been spun up. So go ahead, tell us your theory on what they must have done to get the engineering this this right. Use the hashtag my theory and put that down in the show notes or the comments and tell us what you think about how they must have spun series up. I look forward to your thoughts, especially if it's something I haven't considered and for the discussion that will emerge out of that. The last bit to talk about is docking at Ceres Station. People often comment that the docking, the ships seem to come straight in at the equatorial plane to Ceres, and under current rocketry, that wouldn't be very practical. We don't have very efficient rockets like they, they do in the city of the Expanse, so what we normally have to do is we have to bring a ship in at the center point of rotation for stations, if there is one, and that would be the way we would accomplish with normal rockets. But in the city of the Expanse, we already know that the, they have main drives that can provide sustained multi-G uh, acceleration even their maneuvering and landing thrusters are able to provide a significant amount of sustained force over time so complex maneuvers like coming into a dwarf planet that's spinning very quickly that wouldn't be very hard to do now the way they show it in the show is really for narrative purposes you need a ship coming in directly at the location they're trying to get to so the user sort of understands where they're going and what's happening you really can't take these indirect indirect paths but given the kind of rocketry they've expressed in the expanse it's really not impractical to give the engineering that they have that they could do it what you would need to do is bring a ship in sort of along the vector to meet a vector of a docking arm as the as it spins around on the equator and that it would just have to be timed perfectly this so the ship comes up to the side of the arm as it spins around at its height as it high its point it would grab the ship and it would just bring it into the docking station Something I find interesting is that for cargo scenarios, offloading cargo would be incredibly easy on series. All you would have to do is stack it up in a bunch of containers, put it on a door in the outside of the station and open the door and let it fly out into space. Ships can worry about picking that up in space somewhere and they don't even have to dock in order to pick up cargo. So if something is sort of rich and imagined as series, it provides a lot of fuel for thought and it's a very fun experiment to sort of think through what the effects of living on series might be. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button. And for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get a pop-up when I post a new show each week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button below to tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today, what you enjoyed, if we left something out, or if you have something to add. If you've gotten this far, use the hashtag series and I'll know you've gotten all the way to the end. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week and as always, stay curious.